and welcome to the Meat and Poultry Intermediary Lending Program Stakeholder Presentation. I'd like to turn over the presentation to Dr. Karama Neal, Administrator for Rural Business Cooperative Service. Dr. Neal, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm thrilled to be here. Really appreciate each of you for making time for this webinar today. We are so excited about the launch of this new Meat and Poultry Intermediary Lending Program, and we welcome your interest. Next slide, please. So I am uh, Karama Neal. I am the Administrator of the World Business Cooperative Service, and I'm pleased to welcome you here today so that our team can share more about this opportunity. To start, I'll share some industry context and a bit about the administration's action plan for building a fairer, more competitive, and more resilient meat and poultry supply chain. Then I'll turn it over to my colleagues for a review of the Meat and Poultry Intermediary Lending Program, MPILP, and the role of our state offices. And of course, we welcome your questions. Next slide, please. As we all know, the pandemic exposed and exacerbated numerous vulnerabilities in America's food supply chain, creating extreme disruptions. The reduction in meat processing capacity is just one example of the supply chain bottlenecks that affected small and mid-sized farmers and consumers. In response to these and other constraints in numerous systems, in July 2021, President Biden issued an executive order promoting competition in the US economy. That was followed on January 3rd, 2022, with the release of the administration's action plan to build a fairer, more competitive, and more resilient meat and poultry supply chain. This is needed because in 2021, just four large packers controlled 85% of the beef processing market, 70% of the pork processing market, and 54% of the poultry processing market. In part because of this, producers are earning less for their product than before, while food prices are rising. Next slide, please. The February 2021 20, Executive Order on Supply Chains, the July 2021 Executive Order on Competition, and the January 2022 Action Plan on Meat and Poultry Supply Chains have all, all have a part in addressing these issues by increasing supply chain resiliency, increasing diversity, creating consumer choice and, and uh, in addressing, um, sorry, creating consumer choice and otherwise improving the economics of the sector and transformation of the US food system. Next slide, please. The Meat and Poultry Intermediary Lending Program is just one of a suite of programs and actions that have resulted. You may have heard before about the Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program. I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a moment. Um, the Meat and Poultry Processing Expansion Grant Program, also administered by uh, RBCS. And of course, I want to call your attention to the Meat and Poultry Processing Technical Assistance Program, which is administered by a sister agency, the Agricultural Marketing Service. If there are processors that you know who are interested um, in technical assistance, please encourage them to visit that website, ams.usda.gov slash MPPTA for Meat and Poultry Processing Technical Assistance and click the big green button to request technical assistance. Of course, today we're here to talk about the MPILP, which provides $200 million in grants to nonprofit intermediary lenders to finance the startup, expansion, and or operation of meat and poultry processors. Next slide, please. Before I turn it over to my colleagues, I want to offer a quick comparison between the Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program and the Meat and Poultry Processing Interle Intermediary Lending Program. Both of these facilitate access to, uh, to capital for processors in the near term, but MPILP has the additional goal of strengthening the financing system for independent processors over the long term. The maximum loans for the Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program are $40 million. There is no maximum loan for the MPILP, but only $10 million of grant funds can be used for a single borrower. Loan guarantees are awarded on a one-by-one -one basis in the Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program. However, MPILP will capitalize revolving loan funds, which in theory could operate in perpetuity. Finally, MPILP is limited to nonprofit lenders like CDFI loan funds, public agencies, tribes or tribal entities, and cooperative lenders like credit unions and farm credit cooperatives. Uh, this is different from food supply chain, which has a uh, more open uh, policy for lenders that can be involved there. Next slide, please. For MPILP, up to 5% are $125,000 of funds, whichever is less, can be used to build capacity for the lender. This is one way we are helping to reach the goal of strengthening the financing system for independent processors over the long term. And the last thing I'd like to mention is that there is the use of revolved funds. So uh, revolved funds in MPILP can be used for the full middle of the food supply chain. Um, 
while the first initial use of the funds is limited to meat and poultry processors. Next slide, please. We are very pleased to be working in cooperation with the Center for Impact Finance of the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire to offer the Credit Ready Meat and Poultry Lending Initiative. This is the second way we are helping reach the goal of strengthening the financing system for independent processors over the long term. The initiative will provide training, technical assistance, and a peer support hub for participating lenders with the goals of strengthening the, the capacity of the lenders already working in the, in the processing finance sector and attracting more lenders to operate in the processing finance sector. Please be on the lookout for an announcement of an RFQ process, a request for qualifications process to select lenders who will participate in designing the curriculum for the initiative. One way to be sure you'll get information on this opportunity is to sign up for updates at usda.gov meet under open programs MPILP. And now I'll turn it back over to Will Dotson for the remainder of the agenda. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Dr. Neil. Uh, I'm Aarti Shirsagar, and I will start with the overview of the MPLP program. Uh, so we have total of dollar two hundred million grant funds. Seventy five million will be available in the first cycle, and one hundred and twenty five million in the second cycle. Uh, this funds will be available for the intermediaries so that they can facilitate financing to qualified ultimate recipients, uh, which will support projects involving startups or expansion of meat and poultry processes. Primary objectives are to strengthen the food supply chain resiliency, provide access to affordable capital, and to bolster the long-term financing capacity of lender who plan to finance the meat and poultry processes. Next slide, please. How does the MPILP work? So mainly the stakeholders involved in MPILP are USDA intermediaries and the ultimate recipients. USDA will receive applications from intermediaries through grants.gov. USDA will then make MPLP awards to eligible intermediaries who are selected through the application process. These intermediaries will then establish the revolving loan funds and lines of credits to the qualified ultimate recipient. Ultimate recipients can then use these funds to engage in eligible projects involving meat and poultry processing activities. Next slide, please. So we have two cycles. The first cycle opened up on uh, May 25th with a 60-day application period closing on July 25th. The anticipated award date would be September 30th of 2022. The second cycle will open up early November with a 60-day application period closing in December. And the anticipated award date for that will be February of 2023. The minimum grant amount that any intermediary can apply is $500,000, and the maximum grant award, which is the aggregate grant amount, is $15 million across two cycles. The performance period is three years, so grant funds should be drawn down and loaned by the intermediary within three years of the date of award. Intermediaries can draw down the funds uh, monthly and save them in the FDIC insured account but any funds that are not loaned by the intermediary to the ultimate beneficiary during this time frame must be returned to the agency. And the MPLP funds must be used within the United States. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the intermediary eligibility criteria. So the type of entity must be domiciled in a state as a cooperative public agency, private nonprofit corporation, or a tribal entity and they must have the legal authority necessary to carry out the grant purpose. They must not be debarred or suspended by the federal government, and they must be registered with SAM. Intermediaries must also demonstrate that they have the capacity to manage MPILP revolving loan portfolio by conducting the outreach, marketing, underwriting of loan application, and also providing loan servicing and monitoring of the proposed MPILP revolving loan portfolio. They can request agency exemption to this requirement if they have a proven record of successfully assisting meat or poultry processing through technical assistance or business development process. And they will also need to ensure that they will employ individuals with experience necessary to administer MPLP loan funds before the grant is obligated. Next slide, please. Continuing. 
So all the essential activities of business lending operations and administration of MPILP revolving funds must be conducted in-house. So intermediaries must have an experienced staff in loan making and servicing in-house. They cannot rely on outside contractors for their routine operations. They must also have sufficient capital and equity so that they can sustain the lending business. And intermediaries must be citizens holding at least 51% membership in any non-public intermediary. They must not be delinquent on any debt and definitely they cannot use any MPLP funds to satisfy the delinquent debt. Uh, intermediaries must also demonstrate that they have sufficient grant amount along with other funds to ensure the completion or continuation of the project for which it has proposed or the grant is made. Uh, they must also inform the agency if they are under the consent order from the federal, state, or tribal agency and must maintain written standard of conduct covering the conflict of interest issue. Uh, intermediaries will be responsible to maintain internal audit and management control system so that they can monitor and evaluate the MPILP portfolio. And they must ensure that the MPILP funds cannot financially benefit any intermediary affiliate through loans or any other type of funding that will raise conflict of interest issue. Uh, also, the intermediaries must hold policies for fidelity bond coverage or employee dishonesty insurance to protect from any losses that might enter. I'll now hand it over to Ms. Lori. She can take it from there. Okay, thanks, Artie. So um, I want to just first say that the IOP is very similar in structure to the intermediary lending program. Um, I understand that a lot of the listeners on today may be part of our partners. Um, the, the one difference with the ILP program is that a grant is made from the agency to that intermediary to establish the fund and uh, leverage other funds, including any equity injection, and then make a loan to the um, meat and poultry processor. Okay, so starting out um, eligibility for ultimate recipients, they must be duly organized as a legal entity. Um, they can be um, a not-for-profit, um, a state or federally recognized Indian tribe, public body, or an individual. The ultimate recipient must be um, a business involved in meat and poultry processing. Uh, this does not uh, preclude them for maybe being in a lease agreement or getting ready to enter into some kind of contractual agreement. Ultimate recipients must support commercial food product projects or custom exempt processing. So when we say food product projects, we're looking at uh, those meats that are sold in quantity um, in our local food stores. When we say custom exempt processing, we're looking at those uh, producers that pretty much produce on a smaller level, maybe for their family or a small community or market in the community. Um, ultimate recipients must be compliant with USDA uh, FSIS um, requirements or they must be custom exempt. If the intermediary is involved in pork, beef, chicken, or turkey processing, it must show that it does not have a greater than one fourth of the market share. And the reason for that is that um, as an agency, we don't want to really invest in, in those producers that are you know, more widely known and produced um, on a greater level. So the way that we're going to monitor that is through a self-certification from the ultimate recipient to the intermediary borrower. If the intermediary is registered as an individual, um, they must be U.S. citizen or permanent U.S. resident. Now, one thing that kind of stands different in the ILP from the IRP and some of our other RBS programs is that the test for credit, the credit expert test, is not applicable under this program. Next slide. Okay, ineligible um, items for the ultimate recipient. 
it will not receive um, IOP funds from an intermediary if its officers have delinquent federal debt or are debarred from doing business with a with the federal government. If um, an ultimate recipient de derives more than 15% of its gross annual revenue from gambling activities, that is the grounds for um, ineligibility. If it derives revenue from activities of an indecent sexual nature or from illegal products or activities. If it is a charitable, that should be or fraternal organization. Um, if, if it derives more than 10% of its annual gross revenue from charitable donors, then that would be grounds from ineligible. So in other words, they have to show that they have a steady stream of income to um, justify repayment of the loan. The intermediary must hold no legal or financial interest in the ultimate recipient or vice versa. So any appearance of conflict of interest, um, if it is a lending institution, investment institution or insurance company, that would be ineligible unless the funds are invested primarily in cooperatives and funds utilized in a new market tax credit structure. If the ultimate recipient holds, okay, that's going back into the conflict of interest. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so how the ILP works. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it has a very similar structure to the IRP. So if you look at the grant, the intermediary will receive a grant from us as the agency to establish a revolving loan fund. So if you move over to the blue, those funds are also leveraged with whatever um, equity contribution and any other leveraging um, from outside sources. Um, creating revolving lines of credit, there's nothing new there that exists under our IRP program. Servicing revolving lines of credit, nothing new there. Loan loss reserve, now this is something a little new, um, and the administrator kind of hit on it earlier uh, in her presentation. So 125,000 or 5% of the grant funds received from the agency, whichever or is less, can be used to establish the loan loss reserve, okay? Um, and loan participations, that's nothing new. You've seen that on the IRP. Okay, moving down to the bottom, the OT recipient, which is pretty much at the imposed um, processors. Um, they can use funds for land purchase and development, leasehold improvements, equipping and building lease facilities, purchasing equipment and machinery, debt refinancing, and interest payment, taxable corporate bonds, that's a new item, feasibility studies, pollution control and abatement, startup costs for capital, fees and expenses related to federal inspection, purchasing cooperative stock, which is a new item, and other purposes related to food for human consumption is also added. Um, next slide. Okay, revolving loan fund guidance. Uh, most of you are probably aware that the RFA is published on my agency website, which is very similar to the notice that we publish uh, for new programs and updates and so forth. Well, section K kind of explains that agency prior approval will be needed on ultra recipient loans that are funded out of agency grant funds. So that means the first time the funds are out, the agency has to approve those ultimate recipient loans. Once the funds have resolved, then that requirement is relaxed. So starting with A, intermediate self-certification, um, that it, it is eligible for the loan, the loan is for an eligible purpose, that the loan complies with all applicable regulations and laws. There are no conflict of interest uh, between the two parties. B, environmental reviews, so for the grant to the intermediary, they're pretty much the deemed categorical exclusions, right? Because we're just setting up the fund at that point. But once the intermediary starts making loans to the ultimate recipient, meat and poultry producer, that is when the NEPA uh, environmental 
requirement comes into play. C, if applicable comments obtained from intergovernmental consultation, this is an executive order that exists in some states. Uh, so once projects are being approved, when you're working with the state offices, they'll be able to tell you if um, that's something that you have to check the box on. Um, D, copies of the ultimate recipient's application, including uh, known purpose and terms, uses and sources of funds, borrower institutional information, and project information, for example, location. Now, under the ILP program, they are not held to the 50,000 uh, population requirement, similar to our other RDS program. Um, e, a self-certification from the ultimate recipient that they do not hold the top four market share um, and P for chick for chicken or turkey, which I kind of explained a little while ago. Um, information on ultimate recipient labor standards wages and benefits, other opportunities offered to workers. I um, also want to mention that grant funds cannot be used to discourage labor unions. Okay, so that kind of falls under that piece. Uh, any other information that the agency may require from time to time. And next slide. Okay, and that was both uses of funds by the intermediary or ultimate recipient. A lot of this will probably sound familiar because of kind of common threads throughout um, our other programs. Uh, number one, assistance in excess of what the ultimate recipient needs. So an example of that is that any cost incurred prior to the time that an intermediary puts an application in, then that will be, um, grounds for ineligibility. Distribution or payment or loans to owners of the intermediary, that's that conflict of interest. Uh, charitable institutions, organizations don't have stable revenue, we kind of talked about that. Research and development on technology that is not commercially available. Other than stock cooperative purchases and security guarantees, loan supporting speculation, arbitrage, or speculative real estate investment. So anything that doesn't pass the SNF test. Uh, number six, any business located within the coastal barrier resource system that does not qualify for um, exceptions is stated in section six of the Coastal Barriers Resource Act. Uh, number seven, businesses located in a FEMA hazard area. Uh, number eight, projects that manipulate a wet line or wetland, excuse me, or otherwise reduce flows of water. Number nine, exemptions from federal inspection, unless they're seeking to expand their operations to obtain a federal grant of inspection or equivalent. And there's a site there. Um, and number 10, alcoholic beverages, tobacco, or dietary supplements. Next slide. Okay, so continuing in that same vein, projects or loans. Um, that create a conflict of interest. We've kind of gone over that. Assistance to federal government employees, active duty military, employees of the intermediary, or any organization for which such persons are directors or officers or have 20% or more ownership. Agriculture production outside of what is specifically listed as eligible under the ILP program in the RFA. Um, the transfer of ownership, unless it will keep a business from closing, prevent the loss of employment opportunities in an area, or provide expanded job opportunities. Any illegal activity, projects in violation of laws or environmental protection regulations. Uh, we've talked about loans to investment institutions or insurance companies, unless it is um, of that cooperative stock purchase or tied to a new market tax credit. Um, golf courses, racetracks, or gambling facilities. Uh, once again, um, if gross and you knew, if gross revenue exceeding 15% comes from gambling activities, then that would be ineligible. And funding of any activities that would discourage collective bargaining or labor organizing. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Lori. This is Kevin Boone. Um, we're going to go over some of the application scoring uh, that's required in the uh, request for uh, applications, the RFA. And what I, what I mentioned to anyone who's seeking a, a grant with, with uh, USDA or, 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 the, or the federal government for that matter, is always look at this scoring because, I did, you know, when, at, when, we, when it comes down to the end and, and uh, the government reviews the application for completeness, for eligibility and so on, there's a score that's eventually applied to the application based upon these criteria. And the way it is funded, it's, it's, it's a competitive scoring process. We look at the highest scoring projects uh, until, and we go down until uh, funding is, is extinguished. So let's go over this. This is listed in the RFA um, that you can find on grants.gov and also on our, our website. And we'll list the link to the website later in the presentation. <clears throat> so the first criteria is experience. Uh, the number of years the inter intermediary uh, has, has been successfully making and servicing commercial loans, particularly in meat and poultry in the future. And there's a graduated scale that you'll see in the RFA, and it'll give, it can allow up to 35 points. And when you go in that RFA and, and read this, you'll see, you know, it, it goes all the way from, uh, yes, we, we currently have a loan fund that's specifically to meat and poultry processing. And it goes all the way down to, we simply have a plan to create a loan fund. So those points will go from, you know, from 35 all the way down to potentially 10 points, uh, depending on, on the experience of the applicant, the intermediary. So the second uh, scoring criteria is leveraging. Uh, if the intermediary contributes additional funds into the proposed MPILP revolving loan fund, there's uh, points given for that equity that's, that's being provided into the fund. Uh, upwards to 10 points, depending on the amount uh, given as, as a total percentage of the fund compared to our, our grant funds, I say our USDA grant funds going into the fund. The third criteria is how does it address uh, COVID recovery? And there's a potential up to four points here. And if the intermediary is located or serves one of the top 10 percent of counties based upon a county risk score listed in the COVID-19 economic risk assessment dashboard, which you can obtain on this uh, website listed here. Or you'll, if you go into the RFA, it'll have the same website listed as well. And it's a simple score. It'll show the parishes, another uh, parish, I'm from Louisiana. It'll show the counties uh, within, uh, you know, that, that are affected the most by, uh, by COVID and will provide a, uh, a scoring. And then equity. If the, uh, the applicants can get up to four points, if the intermediary is located or serves a community uh, with a score of 0.75 or above on the, social, on the CDC's social vulnerability index, which again can be found, and we have it listed here at these websites, uh, which are also listed in the RFA. So uh, again, when looking at an application with this program, I, you know, as, as you go through the RFA to see if you're eligible and see how you will develop your application template and lending plan and so on, it's always important to see this. The, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. So uh, the next scoring criteria is climate impact. The applicant will receive points for the items uh, according, according to our priority points given. Uh, if it affects, if the, the project can, uh, can affect or, or assist in the climate impact. So if the intermediary is located or serves a coal or an oil or gas or power plant community whose economic well-being ranks higher than 80 on the distressed communities index, which is available at this website, uh, we can ap apply four points. Or if the intermediary simply demonstrates through a written narrative how the proposed climate impact as illustrated in the scope of work will improve the livelihood of residents and meet 
pollution and clean energy goal. So you have an option here is uh, check out that website to see if the project is located there. If it, if it scores you know, uh, higher than 80, uh, you can use that as a scoring or you can uh, go the narrative route. Okay, the next scoring criteria is tribal location. If the intermediary is located within the boundaries or serves a tribe's reservation or tribal trust land or regional corporation or village corporation as defined by Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, uh, there's points that will be applied as well or could be applied as well. So look at that and, and document that fact too. If, if the intermediary is serving those areas, you can check out the website there uh, also for the locations. The next scoring criteria is lender training. We can apply up to uh, 10 points if the scope of work includes training a, a training program for one or more of the loan officers to increase the capacity of the intermediary to finance meat and poultry processors. Next slide, please. And staffing, if, if the intermediary and, and described in the scope of work through the uh, application template that the intermediary is hiring at least one additional loan officer to focus on meat and poultry processes. Uh, we can consider an additional 10 points there. We also point out that in addition to the intermediary must provide information on labor standards, for example, wages, benefits, and other opportunities offered to its employees. So the next scoring criteria is what do we have in the pipeline? If the intermediary can document a specific independent meat and poultry processor that, that they're projected to use at least 50% of the ILP grant funds, we can apply points up, upwards to 15. And then sustainability. Uh, if, if the scope of work uh, offers a plan for extending the focus of the of financing meat and poultry processing through the deployment, through the deployment of the revolved funds, meaning after the grant funds are loaned to an ultimate recipient, and then they're revolved again, but used for the same purposes, and, and that's projected in the plan, we can provide points for scoring up to 14. I mean, up to four, I'm sorry. So a total possible points of 100. However, the administrator has some additional uh, leeway of providing an additional 10 points based upon uh, certain uh, priority points that, that she can provide uh, through a geographic location or if it's a certain uh, industry or, or species that we're looking that we see maybe a cluster in one and not in the other to try to balance, balance the program nationwide, that can happen as well. So keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So here's the timeline of this program. We, the USDA announced it on May 26. Uh, we had a, uh, we'll be having our, our stakeholder meeting today, the first one, which is gonna go over the basics of the program. We will have a second stakeholder webinar on June 14th. You'll be able to register on that one the same place at, at, our, uh, at our website. Uh, the second webinar will go over in more detail of what are the responsibilities of an intermediary once a, a grant is, is approved? So the, the first window for or the first deadline for the application is July 25th. Uh, there'll be a, an evaluation and scoring time frame uh, and grants will be awarded by September 30th. And then there's a second window as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, that window will have $125 million uh, set aside for that particular window of opportunity. So it's November 1st, we'll have a scoring and evaluation time period up to December, I'm sorry, uh, the deadline will be December 31st and then we'll have a, a, an evaluation and scoring timeline and award grants projected to be February 28th of 2023. Next slide, please. So application instructions, um, we have a self-screening guide that is placed in the website, the MPI website. It's a really good tool 
it, it will provide a flow chart to determine if you're eligible or not and determine if your, your proposed, proposed uh, use of funds are eligible. So take a look at that, um, you know, after the presentation, look at that, uh, that self-screening guide. It's, it's really helpful. Uh, the first thing to do in applying for this particular program, and I, I can't stress this enough, uh, it's very important because there's some time frames involved here, is to register with SAM.gov. We have the website listed here. Uh, it will also be uh, listed and mentioned in the grants.gov uh, website where our application material is. And we need to, or the applicant needs to obtain a valid, unique identi identity identifier number. That number is necessary to file the application. So um, again, if you're interested in this program, if you plan on applying, this is, this is a must and this has to be done um, really at, at first step. So get that done. Um, and then from there, uh, the ingrants.gov website and also on our, on our MPILP website, we have an application template. Uh, or you can simply submit a narrative as it's described in the RFA. What we have done uh, as an agency is we, we decided to, to create a template that can keep you within the narrative format of the RFA. So it's up to you. It's your choice of, of what to use. Uh, however, the RFA says, that, you know, we must have that narrative in, in ABC order, you know, and the template can do that for you. So take a look at that template. And then submit your applications uh, through grants.gov no later than July 25th. Uh, it's, it's an absolute. Uh, we cannot accept any applications after that date. Okay, next slide. So what's, what's needed for an application? And um, I, I have to say it's, it's pretty simple. When, when if, if you've applied for government grant applications in the past, uh, this is really straightforward and, and not uh, as, as detailed as we've seen in other grant programs. So what's required is a, a standard form. It's, it's an SF-424. We've seen them within USDA grants. And I know they're used within other uh, grant programs as well. And then you'll need to submit a 424A or C, depending on if there's any construction involved. So in most cases, we will see this as a 424A, which, which outlines the budget of, of what the intermediary uh, plans to do with the funds and so on. Now the support material, we'll need to see any contracts that you have uh, between individuals uh, that, that relate to the the loan fund. We'll need to see articles uh, or organizational documents like articles of incorporation, bylaws, certificates of good standing, a list of board members, um, evidence of authority that, that you can even conduct a lending program from the board. We'll need financial statements. So we'll need pro forma balance sheets at startup and then projected for three additional years. We'll need financial statements for the last three years of the uh, revolving loan fund or the intermediary uh, or since its establishment. So uh, it's, it's three years or, or establishment, whichever is less. And then we'll need projected cash flow and earnings statements of at least three years moving forward with a list of assumptions. We'll also need uh, either that application template that was mentioned or the project narrative as is described in the RFA. And then we'll need a, the latest audit report if you have one available. And then we'll need a written agreement to abide by any agency audit requirements that are outlined in 2 CFR 200, 2 CFR 200. And then we'll need a resolution of support from the, the uh, intermediary board of directors. And then we'll need a lending plan. Next slide, please. So after this is said and done, so let's say the intermediary is awarded the grant funds. What's required, required for reporting? 
So there's a standard form, an SF-425. Uh, if you've done grants before with USDA, you've seen this form. And awardees must semi-annually submit the SF-425 between grant approval and a disbursement of funds to ultimate recipients. The next form is a, an RD-1951-4. Uh, this is provided quarterly on a semi-annual basis and is filed online. Uh, this will provide uh, online filing instructions uh, in the letter of conditions once the intermediary is awarded the grant. So those, that particular form is provided quarterly or semi-annual uh, and they're due 30 days after that review period. Now, the reports are required quarterly during the first year after grant closing. And if all grants funds are not utilized during the first year, quarterly are required until at least 90% of the funds have been loaned out to the ultimate recipients. Therefore, reports, I mean, thereafter, reports are required semi-annually. Annual project performance reports. Intermediaries must support a must submit a performance report annually, with first report submitted no later than six months after receiving the grant. There's a stage one and a stage two report. Stage one is an annual report that is submitted annually for five years after receiving a grant under this section, and then the stage two is an annual report completed and submitted annually for six years through fifteen or payoff of the last loan made with original grant funds, whichever come first. Okay, next slide, please. And from here, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Will Dotson. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Uh, hey. Let me work on just a little technical issue. Get my camera started. All right. Um, thank you for your attention today. We appreciate it. We're excited about this new program. I'd uh, like to thank Dr. Karama Neal, our administrator for Rural Business Cooperative Service, who spoke at the beginning. Um, appreciate her leadership with setting this program up. Um, you heard from my colleagues, Lori Pittman, Kevin Boone, and Artie Scherzhager, and they all presented different portions of today's presentation. Uh, Additionally, we do have on our panel a couple representatives from FSIS as well as AMS. We have uh, Sarah Hernandez with uh, AMS and we have Paul Woolsey from FSIS um, for any type of technical information or questions that, that may arise. So we appreciate you holding tight with the questions. We've got about 45 minutes with this segment. So we will work to address as many questions as we can. If we happen to not get to your question, we will get it answered uh, and we will make that available to you um, very soon. So the, the information presented today, there are some links that Artie has dropped into the chat that will provide further information that I'm gonna cover on, on some notes before we get into Q and A. Um, so we shared a lot of information with you today. There will be a transcript of this presentation, as well as a recording, um, as well as the slides that will be put on the MPILP website. You see the link in the presentation here. Um, also, we are dropping in an attachment of the slides, so you have those in advance, um, as well as the notice for the program. We call that an RFA, which is a request for uh, applications. If you file an application with this program, um, it must go through grants.gov and you will find that document um, on grants.gov and you'll be able to, to get further detail on the program. So with that, um, I just wanted to move into some typical questions that, that we've been receiving on the program. Um, first off, as Kevin mentioned, uh, please visit the website, the MPILP website. Um, that you see on the slide. When you go there, there are resources that will walk you through uh, what we shared today. So there's going to be an application checklist. There's a self-screening guide that I encourage you to walk through. Um, before you take too much time uh, investing into the program, make sure you check the self-screening guide out. Uh, go through those steps, 
to ensure that you are preliminary, pre preliminarily eligible for the program. Um, it'll give you some, some feedback and some information uh, with your situation so you can find out uh, if this program is applicable to you. Uh, we also have the application template uh, on the side as well as a fact sheet. So uh, a lot of, again, a lot of the information that we shared today um, is on that site. There's, um, there's another link that was dropped um, in the chat, and that link is a, a contact link. Um, there's a typical question that's come up about uh, when will we find out um, about uh, awardees in the program? So remember that this program is a grant to lenders. Um, the ultimate recipient, so that's the entity that will, so it's a grant to a lender, and then those funds are relent uh, to borrowers. Those borrowers are meat and poultry processors, but initially um, with this program, our awards go to a lender. Um, so the typical question we're getting, which everybody would ask, and I would ask is, do you have a list? Well, we don't have the list yet because we're going through the first competition. Um, I can tell you that this cycle awards will be, um, will be made and those obligations will take place by September 30th. So after September 30th, stay in touch with our agency, watch our website. Um, there is a contact for our state offices that administer our rural development programs. Uh, they will be in the loop when information comes out about awards. Um, so for your particular state, there is a state office that that services that state, and there is a um, there there are business staff. There's a business program director um, that you can stay in contact with to keep updated uh, as well. But we'll, that information will also uh, hit our website once it's cleared and awards are made. So just FYI, that comes in um, pretty regularly. Um, so another question that comes in, uh, because we are rural, uh, rural development, uh, there is no rural requirement with this program, um, but there is a U.S. requirement. So the projects have to be in the United States. Uh, there has to be a U.S. ownership uh, of the ultimate recipient, the intermediary, which is our applicant in this program that the grant goes to. They also have to be in the United States. Uh, another typical question is about the farm credit system. Uh, land banks and ag credit banks are typically structured as cooperatives. So yes, we can work with those entities. So we, we see that question pretty regularly. Um, just wanted to hash out dates with you one more time. July 25th is our first cycle. Um, so that's 11.59 Eastern Standard Time, July 25th. The second cycle will be uh, 11.59 Eastern Standard Time, December 31st. Uh, so keep that in mind, that those are the two deadlines with this program. We look at awards for the first cycle, September 30th. We look at awards for the second cycle, February 28th. Um, the applications must be sent through grants.gov. So Kevin, Kevin mentioned this earlier. Um, that, that is the, that's the application intake for this program. Um, this program is, for those that are familiar with the interme Intermediary Relending Program, this program mirrors that program in many respects. And I know those applications are submitted in a different fashion, but this program uh, being a grant, it runs through grants.gov. So that is, our, that is our intake for the system. There should be a link uh, in the chat. I don't have it in front of me, but it should take you on grants.gov to the MPILP site. So if, it, if you have any trouble with that, you can go to www.grants.gov and you can search for MPILP and it'll pop up. Um, so one of my colleagues today that did not present, but she's, she's with us is Sarah Hernandez with AMS. And she wanted me to mention that and this program was mentioned in an earlier slide, and it's called the MPPTA program. So that's Meat and Poultry Processing Technical Assistance Program. So it's a technical assistance program that connects businesses and enterprises uh, with expertise and resources, um, tackling a variety of technical issues um, that the businesses may face. 
when looking to expand or extend or establish meat and poultry processing uh, businesses. So this can range from applying for federal grants and loans and developing business plans and feasibility studies to expertise on animal handling, facilities design, food safety, as well as marketing and supply chain development. Uh, the program operates as a national network of providers uh, who, who match processors with technical resources that are right size and customized to their specific processing expansion project needs. Uh, processors that are interested in assessing uh, technical assistance uh, can get started by visiting and it's, um, it, again, it's MMPTA. So it's www.ams.usda.gov slash MMPTA. Um, I will drop that website link in the, in the chat as we're going through and answering questions. So I know it's a lot to throw at you, I apologize, but these are typical questions. We wanted to go ahead and get those out front. Um, and also, before we get into the, the Q&A, we do have, as Kevin mentioned, we've got a, our next webinar that's scheduled Tuesday, J June 14th, and it's going to run between 2 to 3 o'clock Eastern time. So please attend that. We'll get a little bit more in depth um, in the program. So with that, we will, we will start working down the list on questions. I would like to, um, and thank you, Dr. Neal. Um, the uh, technical assistance link has been dropped in the chat. So I will open it up, start working down the questions. And if uh, my colleagues uh, will be available, um, uh, just please stand by. So let's see here. Uh, so the participant list, again, we will release that once we get cleared, awards are made um, and that's published. Uh, then you will find out which lenders have received awards in this program uh, to set up these funds. Is there a minimum maximum rate and length of term the lender must honor? What are restrictions on funds once they are repaid by the eligible borrower? So <clears throat> I'll start off the answer on this one. Um, there is a 30 year uh, overall term limit um, but the lender sets the, the rates and terms. The rates have to be reasonable and customary. Uh, the agency has to approve you know, that rate. So this operates typically like our intermediary relending program. Uh, restrictions on funds once the, the money is revolved back into the fund. Uh, we do have restrictions initially, uh, of course, with the meat and poultry processing. When it is revolved, it's a broader, broader scale that we're looking at the entire food supply chain. Uh, so the, the eligibility of the use of funds at that point would be applied to the uses that are found in the food supply chain guaranteed loan program. So keep that in mind, it gets broader once those are um, paid back into the revolving loan fund. Um, we shared the slide, so you should have that available. Uh, regarding market share, does this refer to the national market? Yes. So we're looking at the U.S. domestic um, market um, when we're, we're considering the, um, the one-fourth share that was mentioned earlier. Can you repeat the statement about other credit? Is it required or not? Uh, there is not a test of credit with the MPILP program. So would I be eligible for a grant for a new for new construction on a cold storage warehouse to support uh, meat and poultry storage and distribution? So I will I will turn that over to my colleagues on this question. So um, Kevin, Artie, Lori, uh, anyone that would like to jump in, feel free. So this is Kevin. Uh, I would say yes. Um, can you hear me, Will? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so the answer would be yes, as long as it's part of the meat and poultry uh, processing unit. Uh, just to have a, a meat and poultry storage and distribution center, uh, the answer would be no. But to be, if it's part of, of the, uh, the, the project uh, that does, uh, you know, meat and poultry processing, the answer is yes. 
the only thing I would just add there is that you know the the larger scope with the um, the uh, after the revolved the funds are revolved and that that uh, scope is larger in terms of the full middle is food supply chain so you have a little more flex more flexibility there. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Dr. Neal. Uh, our next question here: We are a nonprofit organization that relies on tax deductible donations for most of our revenues. Um, I, under, I understand we are ineligible to apply. Is that correct? If so, can we partner with an established CDFI that will be the lead for the application? So again, I'll turn it over to my colleagues on that one. I'll, I'll try my best on that one as well. Um, so private nonprofit organizations are eligible, but when it, re when it, when it relies on at least 10% of its uh, gross revenue as a, a tax do deductible donation, it excludes um, it excludes el eligibility and considers the intermediary a charitable or fraternal organization per the definition. So um, from there, can we partner with a CDFI? I would say yes. You know, uh, th there's a lot of eligibility criteria that we have to uh, address, but there's, it's very possible that you could partner if the CDFI is the applicant, maintains all of the documents, the organizational documents for the loan fund. If I could just chime in on that one just a minute as well. I, this, mm -hmm. this, actually, this question has come up about the 10%. And Correct. we wanted to make sure, I think we've, we've talked about this program as having similar eligibility requirements as, our, as IRP. And that of course is not consistent with IRP. And so we do wanna be clear that we're, we're, we're examining that and want to make sure that there is clarification there that, that we are meeting the intent of what we're trying to do here. And so I just would say, stay tuned. We'll, we'll continue to look at that and we'll be in touch um, with additional information to clarifying what is meant by that 10% um, guideline that's listed there. All right. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Kevin? Um, can you clarify the types of lenders that are eligible, for instance, as a farm credit system qualifies? So that was asked before I answered it. Um, so in the program, just to rehash, private nonprofit corporations, public agencies, tribes, tribal entities, and cooperatives um, are eligible. If you're a lending institution that does not fit this program, we would like to remind you that we do have the food supply chain guaranteed loan program. And that program is up and running and available. And you can find information for that program as well uh, through our website. So I would encourage um, I would I would encourage you to look into that program as well. All right, bear with me just a minute. So how long are these funds expected to remain in a revolving loan fund? Um, the answer, and I, I'll let my colleagues jump in on this, is it, it is the fund is set up, it's a grant. So it, it's setting up a fund that is su supposed to act in perpetuity. Now, because it is a grant, um, there are requirements under what we have of Regulation 2 CFR 200 uh, that come into play for, you know, for managing those initial funds. Um, but the, the idea is that it, it's similar to IRP, but it's a blend between that and another program we have, which is a, um, a grant that sets up a revolving fund. Um, it is supposed to run in, into perpetuity. That's a quick answer, but um, I don't know if uh, any of my colleagues want to jump in on that. You know, I would agree. I, I, I may add that, um, you know, the beauty of the program is it's specific initially to meat and poultry processors um, for the, the grant funds to be lent to a, an ultimate recipient. But after those monies are revolved and come back to the intermediary, they can be used, as Dr. Neal mentioned, for a broader purpose. And that is the middle of the food supply chain which opens it up to a much broader lending um, industry, in, you know, industries that you can consider. All right, thank you, Kevin. So trying to keep on time, we've got a little, little under 30 minutes. Um, so the, uh, the, 
the lender does not have to have a pipeline established at time of application or award. That's the question. Um, can it just be in planning? Uh, also, if they don't loan out the funds within the first three years, will they get an extension uh, like with the IRP program? Or do they have to return the unused funds at the end of the three year time frame? Uh, so I'll take I'll take part of that. Um, the, the pipeline determination, it, it, that's reflected in the scoring. Um, of course, we're, we're looking for lenders that are ready to, to come to us with a pipeline of projects, uh, but that, that falls back into the scoring criteria. You, you get points um, for indicating that in the scope of work. Um, if the funds are not utilized in the first three years, will, will they get extensions? Um, there's the ability to get up to two extensions in the program. Now, um, those extensions, when they're requested, can be up to a year uh, each, um, but the overall time frame cannot exceed five years. Anybody on the panel want to add to that or jump in? No, I think it, that's answered. All righty, thank you. Uh, the words... Grant and loan are used interchangeably. Um, so uh, it is, it's a bit of a hybrid because the grant is being awarded to a lender um, and then in turn loans are made uh, out of that fund. Uh, so we, we kind of hit on this earlier. Um, you know, we, we have to track the, the grant funds uh, when funds are revolved, that's a different question. Um, but the, the idea is that we're, we're trying to set up a long-term uh, funding program with this program. If I can just add on to that, that question, just sort of reading it myself and interpreting, and hopefully if we don't get to the question of the person, they, the requester will just follow up. But just to be clear, the, the intermediary lender is making loans to the ultimate recipients. Those are loans that are expected to be paid back. They're not expected to be forgiven. I just wanted right. to, to hone in on that language that was part of the question. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Um, is a loan loss reserve mandatory as with the IRP? So the, the original funding for this is a grant. Um, there, there's an option in the program to set up a reserve uh, for the lender, uh, but we, we don't have a mandatory um, loan loss reserve because we don't have a, uh, the intermediary is not paying a loan back to the agency. And uh, anybody on the panel, feel free to jump in uh, anytime on these. Um, can a foreign owned company domiciled in the USA be eligible? Um, we do have US ownership requirements. So I don't have that in front of me, but I believe it that a majority of the entity has to be uh, U.S. owned. If it's, you know, if it's complex structure, we can certainly look at that and advise. Because I know, um, you know, there could be an affiliate situation, things like that. So we, we will have to look at that individually. Who sets the interest rate? The lender sets the interest rate. So again, that needs to be reasonable and customary um, and able to set up a sustainable fund. So does the intermediary register at SAM uh, for the grant or the individual? So the intermediary will, will register through SAM uh, at application. Does anybody have any further comments on that one? All right. So we've got a question about county risk scores and um, for a particular state, what scores are you looking for um, in terms of risk scores? Um, I know this goes back to scoring and there is a link that, um, I believe this is what this question pertains to. There, there is a link that discusses that website. So, um, um, and, and just to follow up, if we do not get your question answered sufficiently today, um, as you go through the website, you look at the resources, we do have an MPILP email address. So let us know. Um, we, can, we can take a deeper dive. Well, what I would add to that is uh, go on the RFA, take a look at the RFA, and uh, it's, it has the link to 
a dashboard that is at USDA. And that dashboard will then take you to those specific links. It's really, and it's, it, it's, it's a really good um, dashboard to, to figure out those particular characteristics of the scoring criteria. So we got, we have a, thank you, Kevin. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Um, we've got a number of questions still time back to interest rates. So again, the lender sets that. Um, the program does mirror IRP. So if you're familiar with that, um, you'll see a lot of similarities with this program. And so I'm just skipping over if we answered a question, just moving forward. So does the does the grant require matching dollars for the intermediary? Um, there there is no match requirement, but there are points that are awarded um, for contribution into the fund. So Kevin highlighted that again. Uh, there was a question uh, that we received about uh, scoring detail, uh, and the scoring detail is found in that that RFA, which is a request for applications. That's a notice. Um, and when you go on grants.gov and you file the application, you'll see that attachment. We also, um, I believe that was dropped in, in the chat. We should have a PDF version of that. So that'll give you that'll give you more detail on that scoring criteria. It was dropped in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, is there a minimum or maximum service area? And can, um, can an individual award be a multi-state or even a national service area for the new developed uh, revolving loan fund? I'll turn that over to the panel. The answer is yes, uh, but what happens is we start getting into um, the areas of scoring where we have to list, you know, are you predominantly helping out a community with that scoring criteria when you deal with a national scope? So, um, you know, I, there's, no, there's no restrictions going regional, national with it as, as written. It's just um, when you get to the scoring criteria to hone in on those specific communities that are affected, um, you, you'll have some work to do to, to, to figure that out in the scoring criteria mm -hmm. and document that. Sorry, I'm just reading through the questions. So got a more detailed question. Will there be a con concentration of risk limitation on ultimate uh, recruitments? For instance, there's a processor looking at a $30 million expansion. Um, can, it, can, that, can I fund the entire grant or the majority of it to them, or is it limited to 25% of the fund, like in IRP? Um, so there is a $10 million cap um, out of the pool. That, that's a $10 million cap for the MPILP funds. Now, we don't set a limit for other funds that are lent by the lender, um, but, that, but we do have a, um, we've got a ceiling on the actual, you know, um, funds that are coming from the grant that are in the form of the loan, if that makes sense, um, to an individual borrower uh, with the program. Um, but we don't have any other caps in terms of if other funds are being lent uh, alongside that to an entity. So we've, we've got a number of questions just really with the life of the fund. Again, um, typically, you know, we're looking at these in perpetuity. We, we are held to 2 CFR 200 because it is, it originates as a grant. Um, but we will, we will get more information out to you in terms of, um, you know, how we're looking at that long-term um, and as funds are being repaid, those become revolved funds. Um, so the nature changes, uh, but, but I realize we, we've got a number of questions on that in that area. So our next webinar, we will cover that. We will get um, 
we'll get more detailed responses to you, uh, you know, regarding that, because I, I see that's a concern. So we've got a question just about the, the servicing and the reporting, and yeah, you know, I'll turn that over to the panel um, to discuss, you know, level of involvement. You know, they're they're asking if, you know, if this goes for 30 years, um, if, do we have reporting for 30 years? Well, um, I do believe it caps at 15 and I'm trying to get to my slide deck. Let's see here. Sorry about that. So um, the only one that could be for an extended period of time is the annual project performance report. And this will be coming out shortly. We don't have it published yet. It's gonna be a, a document uh, that we, we prepare in-house. It's gonna give, um, we're gonna have you know items in there that assist us in determining how the funds are being used and if it's being used according to you know to the program guidelines and so on, so we can get measurements on the program. So the the report that lasts the longest is that stage two annual performance report, and that's the report that's submitted annually for six years through fifteen, or the payoff of the last loan made with the original grant funds whichever come first. So 15 years is, is the, uh, the last of the reporting. So we, we have a question, can this program help an existing meat processor become USDA inspected if they are not already? So we're, we're talking about the ultimate recipient. Sorry, go ahead. Dr. Neal, were you mentioning something? Oh, sorry. I was actually thinking about that. So yeah. it, it, it does sound like it's aligned with processing. It may be something where we want to spend a little time on it. So maybe I would encourage the, process, the, the questioner to submit a question through the formal site so we can research that and come back with a formal answer for you. Um, it sounds on the surface like it might, but just want to make sure that it's contributing to the processing uh, in, in particular. All right. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Uh, what is the expected equity injection from the ultimate recipient? So I'll turn that over to the panel. That, that is going to be determined in the lending plan that is submitted to us. And um, there's, there's not a percentage amount or dollar amount set within the RFA. So it's whatever is the lending criteria that is developed by the intermediary you know, that is reasonable and customary. Um, that would be my, my answer there. Okay. Um, are there similar programs for intermediaries that support the seafood industry? Um, I would just, maybe I'll chime in there. I think the part of the, the thought process around this was to prioritize the, the meat and poultry processing sector as it's defined here, but recognizing that revolved funds can be used across the food supply chain. So certainly with those revolved funds, they could be used to, to finance seafood processing, seafood storage, distribution, you know, everything in the middle of the food supply chain with regard to seafood and other foods. All right, thank you, Dr. Neal. And, and again, um, you know, there, there's various questions about the, the life of the fund, uh, reporting requirements, clawback. Um, we, will, we will get information out to you on that. And, and again, we will, we will get responses to uh, each question and get those put on the website as well. So excuse me while I'm just, just reading through some of these questions. We appreciate these questions. They're, they're great questions and I um, appreciate your attention with us. So far, we've only we've only lost a few. <laughs> so we've got about another 15 minutes um, here. So we'll we'll try to tackle as many as we can get. So what is considered an active pipeline? Um, this entity has uh, many borrowers that are planning projects. Some may start this year, some next. Um, some are approved. Others are are still not yet to the underwriting stage. So I'll turn that over to the panel. 
Yeah, Will, this is Kevin again. Um, the RFA does not specifically address uh, the needs, but I would say within the application, we would want to know specifically the, the entity that you're considering, uh, the purpose, uh, and, and, you know, an estimate of an amount. Um, mm -hmm. So that's all that's needed. Um, so can grant funds be loaned to a poultry house farm that is on contract with a national uh, integrator? Um, perhaps I'll chime in here. I think the, the, the national integrator is, is probably less of an issue if, unless it's in the top four. So that's, that's what the standard is. And again, in this, in this uh, first round of, 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 of lending, those projects will come back to uh, the agency for review. And we'll certainly let you know if there is a concern that the, the intended uh, borrower, the ultimate recipient is in the top four, but it's, it's really the top four in those, in those four areas, uh, those four species that are ineligible. So it can be national, it just may not be in the top four. Thank you, Dr. New. Uh, next question. Also, Will, if you don't mind, I'd have to also question, if, uh, did I hear a poultry house, a grow house? Yes, poultry house. So, um, you know, if, if the poultry house is, it would have to do processing as well, you know, meat and slaughter of a, uh, slaughter of a, a carcass. A carcass. Um, so just growing it uh, wouldn't, wouldn't qualify there. So also, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Neal, you know, address the... Uh, the national uh, integrator. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, what is the ma maximum amount the intermediary can apply for? That's, uh, that's 25 million in the program. Uh, does, the, does the end loan collateral need to be pledged to the USDA? There's, so again, it's a grant. So we're, you know, we're not looking at repayment back to the agency. Um, so, you know, security, Security would rest um, with the lender, um, but again, because it's a grant initially, you know, it is held under two CFR two hundred. Um, so there are, you know, requirements when grant funds are um, initially uh, dispersed. And again, um, we will follow back up with, you know, a response as to the longer term as those funds are revolved and and uh, requirements. Just, just to add, is, just a quick, sure. quick clarification there. It's a $15 million um, maximum. I'm sorry, I said 20. Yeah. No worries, we have other program. Program, programs that go up that high. And just wanted to thank Kevin for that correction on the grow house. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize for that. I have my, my programs mixed here. So um, yeah, 15 million. Thank you, Dr. Neal. I, I knew something was clicking in the back of my mind that I said something wrong there. Um, let's see. So bear with me, just working through here some more. And we got about 10 minutes. Um, can I loan the entire grant to one ultimate recipient? So I'll turn that to the panel. Uh, the answer is yes. With, with one quick caveat um, that yes. up, up to $10 million, right? So up to $10 million of of MPILP funds can be used for one for one loan, one recipient. So That's right. if you have less than $10 million and it can go, if you have a $15 million loan, you got to find $5 million from another source. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. So just reading through here, just bear with me. So will intermediaries be partially funded or is it all or nothing? Um, uh, maybe if you can follow, follow up a little more clarification on that, um, you know, we, I, I know, think the, what the, I'm getting out of that question, Will, uh, we have some notices where it will state if there is a tie at the end, or if there is not enough funds for the last uh, applicant that we have available, will it be funded partially or, or will it be uh, disqualified or, or not funded? Uh, we did not address that in the RFA. Um, mm. And quite honestly, it's something that we would have to look into and come back with an answer. 
Yeah, and the, the other thing I'll add, I interpreted the question as, as saying, like, does it have to be $15 million or, or sort of nothing, but it can be arranged there. So I, I, again, if the questioner has additional um, information that can help us get at the answer, please let us know. So once funds have been revolved back into the revolving loan fund, can they be utilized for other types of processors, such as grain processors versus um, meat and poultry? Absolutely. So once, once the, the funds are revolved, it's open to the middle of the food supply chain, not just meat supply chain, food supply chain, and not just processing, middle of the food supply chain. So um, we've had questions earlier about distribution or storage or aggregation, uh, those kinds of things that hold middle of the food supply chain is open for uh, the revolved funds. And that's explained in the, no, in the notice in the RFA. Um, and you can also look at the food supply chain guaranteed loan program as a reference uh, that has the same kind of, of eligibility, very similar kind of eligibility there. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Um, and I'm just, I think we got through a lot of the Q&A. Um, looks like we got a little over five minutes. And if anybody sees a question on this, uh, please jump in. I, I'll just, maybe I'll jump in quickly here. There are a few that, that showed up in the chat and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'll just mention one of them that I see and I think we're capturing these so we can address them um, going forward. But do any of, it says, do any of the allowable pur purposes include investments in talent and labor such as training, recruitment and incentives? Um, not 100% clear if that question is referring to the intermediary or to the borrower, to the ultimate recipient. But again, do want to note that with for the intermediary, um, up to 5% of the funds are $125,000 can be used for capacity building kinds of activities. Again, this is explained in the RFA. Um, we welcome those applications that might address that. If it, again, if to the questioner, if there's additional context that you want, please use the, the inbox to ask that question. We'll make sure we get you a full answer. I'm working, working my way uh, just through the chat, just bouncing around. <laughs> So I apologize if we don't get to you again, um, we will work to, to get all these answered. Um, can an intermediary lend funds to a meat and poultry producer who pays for third party butchering, then the product comes back to the producer for them to create and develop value added products. Um, my understanding is that we do allow uh, contracting in the process and I'll turn it over to the panel, make sure I'm correct. I would agree with, as well. As per the RFA, it allows for contracting. Does a member-owned credit union qualify as an applicant if it holds nonprofit status? If the credit union can demonstrate that it is a cooperative, yes. Um, can you uh, can you elaborate? Um, or be more specific about the expected level of capitalization required of the entity applying to be an intermediary. So I'll, I'll take the first part of that. Um, so from the intermediary's perspective, uh, again, we do not have a matching re requirement. We do provide uh, points in our scoring system, you know, scoring structure. Um, for uh, contribution into the fund. And so that, that's reflected you know, in the score. So um, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, various sources of funds with that. It could be cash, I believe it can be in kind. And that's, that's where I'll turn it back over to the panel, make sure I didn't misstep on that. Um, and if anybody has anything else to elaborate, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, it cannot be in kind, it must be cash. for the fund. What will the agency's process for reviewing all initial loans from MPILP funds and affirming they are satisfied with the loan purpose and underwriting? It's a good question. Um, Lori, I don't, want, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, Lori Pittman is our program lead for IRP. So um, if you're comfortable, uh, please take that question. Mm -hmm. Will, could you, could you repeat that? Uh, sure. What will the agency's process be for reviewing initial loans from, from the MPILP grant fund um, and 
and the agency, you know, and, and affirming that the agency is satisfied with loan purpose and underwriting. So basically what's our, right. what is typically so, the process? Right. So when an intermediary applies to us for the grant, um, they have to show us how they're going to collect information on the ultimate recipient. So what we'll be looking for, as a matter of fact, I think we actually have a template sort of devised to help kind of capture the information. So we want to make sure that um, the ultimate recipient is domiciled in the U.S. We want to see the rates and terms that they're going to charge and confirm that it's uh, for an eligible purpose. And also the top fourth market figure that has to be checked. So it's probably about maybe five or six items that the agency wants to verify. Okay, can you can you repeat that last part, Lori? Kind of okay. broke up just a little bit. Oh, okay. I was saying that it's probably about five or six items in that kind of checklist that the agency wants to make sure are in compliance before we will um, approve on those agency funds being loaned out. All right. I appreciate that, Lori. Thank you very much. Um, does, does anybody on the panel have any comments or any, we're, we're drawing close to um, the end of today's session, um, but I'd like to open it up if anybody on the panel has any, any thoughts or comments uh, to close. Thank you. Will, uh, as, as to the last question, if the applicant will go to the MPILP website and in other resources, there is a checklist that Lori just mentioned. So it would give that applicant a good idea what we are looking for, uh, for approval of an ultimate recipient. All right, thank you, Kevin. Maybe I'll so, just close out with a, a, another thanks uh, to all of you for your interest, for your really excellent questions. Um, I invite you all to visit the website and register if you've not already for the June 14th webinar, which will focus even more on the application process. Again, we are excited about your interest, excited about this program, and look forward to, to having applications from you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Neal. And, and thank you, everybody, for your interest and your, um, your attention and your good questions. And um, we will... Uh, we will see you at the next webinar. So thank you again. And with that, uh, Scott, I'll turn it over you, to you to uh, end the presentation. Thank you. That concludes today's presentation. Take care, everyone. Be safe.